please welcome to the stage Peter Chernin, co-founder and partner at TCG, for a conversation with Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde. Thank you. Let us have some fluid. Let us yes. kick off this jet lag. Let's Let us go. welcome one Peter Chernin. Of course, you know him as a key investor <coughs> in the world, well, of content, really. This is about pop culture, apparently, but you've got the Chernin Group, TCG. You've also been, of course, building up content production studios. You've got North Road. But 14 years ago, you were running Fox and arguably biggest cable, global content provider, sports, news, media, you name it. How do you think the world of cable is currently standing up to the disruption of streaming? I think the world of cable is unfortunately done. Okay. Um, you know, big, it's, big take. it is on its way out. You know, I think it has probably declined 40-ish, close to 50% from its peak. And I don't see any scenario in which it doesn't keep going down. So. And... <clears throat> From that perspective, therefore, does it go down by merging, by consolidating, by people eating one another and them all getting into the streaming business? Well, I think that they are two separate things. I think the people who are in the streaming business are already there. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you're all of a sudden going to see sort of third tier cable channels merging and becoming so streaming. So we're done with streaming births. This is it. We're I believe this is it. I believe it's, it's too costly. The mode is too big to enter, so I don't think you're going to see lots of new players. Did you pour me some I water? Did. Thank you so much. What kind of person I am. Uh -huh. um, when it comes to the streaming giants, what amazes me is actually how international they are in the respect that are you seeing many Middle Eastern streaming companies pop up? You're someone who <coughs> intimately knows this region. You know who I have been working with them for a long time. How, how do you think streamers are ending up being deeply global companies and all US-based, basically? Well, I think it is two things. One, I think it's fundamentally capital, which is they just, they have the capital and the investment and the will to grow globally. And then secondly, I think it's a combination of two things locally, which is one is lack of investment, but two, there's also a regulatory question around this, which is streaming over the last seven or eight years has been allowed to grow globally with very, very limited regulatory constraints. Okay. And not, in my opinion, not necessarily to the better mm -hmm. of some local territories. Will regulation <coughs> change, do you think? Could it, will it ever be able to oversee streaming in that way? Well, I think you'll see some regulation change growing in Europe, growing, but weirdly, you know, they were sort of asleep at the wheel the last why? Five years. I don't know. Because the one thing the Europeans historically good, were good at was regulation. <laughs> and, they still are leading the charge yeah. when it comes to thinking about right. AI regulation. But they somehow didn't. But they were very strong regulators of content businesses because they were protective of their own content businesses. And they have allowed the big streaming platforms to go in there and largely take over the media businesses in each of those countries. And you know, you'll see it happen over the rest of the world unless certain areas decide we are going to do things to, I'm not sure you should try and keep them out, but you should make sure that there are certain requirements for local programming, that right. there are certain things that happen to protect your local programming. So for someone like you, who is actually creating and investing in content <coughs> when perhaps some of the juggernauts are pulling back on their budgets or content, is there rich opportunity in thinking about international content, not just US English language? Well, you know, when we, when we established North Road nine months ago, mm. you know, at that point, we were the leading independent television movie producer with shows like Planet of the Apes and Ford versus Ferrari and Greatest Showman, etc. We had just bought what I think is the leading documentary company in words and pictures. Um, but we said two things. We said that the two, we want to keep investing in, in scripted, but we said the two greatest areas of growth we believed would be nonfiction, because it's the easiest way for those platforms to save money yeah. as they're cutting back. And we are, I think, the producer of the number one nonfiction show in the world, which is Love is Blind. We'll get to that in a minute. Right? And then the second thing we said is we believe international will grow faster than domestic. So 
We have just bought a Turkish production company. We're in negotiations to buy a Mexican Spanish company. And so we are investing in international content because it's an area we believe in. Middle Eastern? Well, I think Turkish is in some ways the most prominent Middle Eastern content. Yeah. You know, the thing that really attracted us to Turkey was A, it's a big country, 130 million people, um, good economy, but B, the, their content exports extremely well both to the Middle East and to Latin America. So we, thought, we, we looked at it as an opportunity to get into the Middle East. You brought up nonfiction and Love is Blind. Now, Netflix's dabble with live content was an interesting one, but a month or so ago. And I want to get some audience participation in this moment. If you can, make sure you've got your apps open and fill in this particular question, because I'm asking whether you think streaming companies should make inroads into live programming. Should we have cultural moments? once again, how we used to a few decades ago go and have a water cooler moment, as you do still about sports, but what about a non-fiction event? What about a bringing together of your favorite show? What about Netflix not making you just eat up all of your favorite show in a binging watch episode, but you actually stagger it? So I want to see whether you think that they should leave into, lean into live events. After, well, to that point. Yes. You know, Netflix has essentially done two live programs at this point. Chris Rock. They did Chris Rock, and then they did the Love is Blind reunion three weeks ago. The Love is Blind reunion basically broke Netflix. Netflix yeah. was down for a couple of hours, which both, A, shows you, I think, a desire to get into live, but B, shows you the extraordinary power of Love is Blind. And the lack <laughs> of, was it a naivety on Netflix's part that well, you they know, wouldn't have that level of interest that would basically break the internet? I wouldn't call anything about Netflix naive. Okay. Um, I think it is, it is extraordinarily challenging to deliver millions of live streams simultaneously, and I think they hadn't anticipated the potential size of the audience for that. They've done it twice. Do you think them and other streamers should experiment more? Will that become Well, I think you've seen, rigor? you know, you've seen certainly Amazon start doing sports, the NFL. You've seen Apple starting to do some smaller live sports. Um, but yes, I'll, I think you'll see them all do it. You know, make no mistake, this is television. If you look at the US, television is streaming. Um, cable is going away, broadcasting is going away. It is television, and so I think everything that you're used to in television over the past 30 years shows will ultimately migrate to streaming. Will news? News will migrate to streaming on some level. You know, you will see a CNN streaming app, you will see Fox, Fox already has a streaming app. So I think, you know, right now, essentially live programming is what's holding up linear television, news and sports. But over time, you know, the, look, the base of cable homes are now, I think, below 50 million. So only half the people in America have the opportunity to watch those things, even if they have the desire. That's down from 90 million homes. Do you think <coughs> once streaming has won out, it has won out. When it, will, we, will they be able to push prices up ever higher? Do you think that there's a limit to that? Because many would say cable is deeply expensive vis-a-vis. -vis. I think you will see streamers continue to push their prices up. You know, Netflix has raised their prices virtually every two years. Disney just did a multi-dollar price increase. Um, yes, I think you'll see them pu push their prices up. We clearly, <coughs> people wanting to see more live events, more of their shows, from the streaming platforms, is the right... I'm interested in your perspective of, for example, a Bob Iger, who I know you're, you're someone who not only knows the media landscape very well, but you also know leadership very well. You know board membership very well, an expertise of yours. How, how do you see someone like Bob thinking about his replacement, thinking about an ESPN, becoming something that they push more into streaming, looking at the assets that they have under their scope at Disney. Are you optimistic? Well, I think in terms of his replacement, you know, it's a slightly weird thing, which is to come in and say, within two years, I'm out again, because most succession processes, certainly the succession processes that I've overseen have been four or five year things. Mm. He just went through his four or five year succession process which in his mind clearly failed. So I think there's going to be a very rushed succession process um, because on some level, this time next year, they should know 
who his successor is. Um, so that part, I think, will be very rushed. ESPN is a challenge in the following sense, which, you know, Bob's a very bright guy, but, you know, ESPN is getting six, six plus dollars from every cable home in America, plus advertising on top of that, to try to make the economics work of, of losing that, you know, let's call it $300 million a month mm -hmm. of affiliate revenue. That's a quick three and a half billion dollars. Um, pretty hard to replace that three and a half billion dollars plus the advertising money that goes with it overnight on a streaming platform. So in my opinion, there's no scenario in life in which an ESPN streaming platform is immediately as successful as the cable platform. And they have rights fees that are still up here. So it, it's a pretty challenging transition to get through. It's interesting, isn't it? This, <clears throat> the dichotomy of making money, an advertising model, and ultimately a subscription model. It's one that Twitter is currently trying to decide what works for them. And I know that they're going to go under new leadership, someone who understands the advertising community well. But what have you made of subscription-based models on social media and ultimately them starting to take talent from <coughs> your previous company, Fox, and building new, after, of course, Fox let Tucker Carlson go, who I'm talking about, he's now thinking about making his new career via subscriptions on Twitter. Is that lucrative, do you think, for talent and indeed for a platform? Well, so far there's no, look, I used to be on the board of Twitter, so I know it well. So far there's no evidence that Twitter can capably raise a subscription platform. So it's nice that Tucker and Elon have announced that, but there's no evidence of it yet being successful. I do think that you will see uh, niche subscription services, but they'll be pretty niche. You know, look, we, we owned for six or seven years Crunchyroll, which is arguably the best niche subscription service. It's, it's a Japanese anime subscription service, which we bought is now up to, I think, about four or five million subscribers. For those subscribers, Japanese anime is life. They will do anything for it. I think there are a few things that are that critical. Could Tucker get to four or five million paid subscribers? I'm not sure. You know, so I think the trade-off is you can certainly make a living if you're charging 10, 15 million dollars uh, among passionate users but you certainly don't have anything near the reach that you used to have. And then you're making a trade-off, which is you're getting paid, you have less influence. As your influence wanes, do you still want to, are still likely to get paid at that level? Um, so I think it's, it's an interesting trade-off for so-called celebrities. Has there ultimately <laughs> been a trade-off since you left Fox and Fox News between people serving different niches, even if they're rather enormous, left versus right, different parts of society. What do you think ultimately has been the impact of that? I'm not sure I understand the question. Do you think ultimately we started to see, in the last 14 years, more polarization? Yes. When it comes to viewing and people serving those viewers? Yes, I think you have seen more polarization. You know, I think... I guess what I would say is, when I left Fox, um, Roger Ailes, who had a series of meaningful problems separate from his stewardship of the news brand, but I think was very smart about one thing, which is if you were 10% to the right, 20% of the right of everybody else, you were the de facto right-wing choice. You didn't have to be 80% to the right of everybody else. You don't win more viewers by doing that. You don't achieve anything else by doing that. And I think Roger was very smart of, certainly it was... Fox News to that point was more to the right of the center, but it wasn't way over here. Mm. Um, and I think what's happened is it's gone way over here. Um, and some of that driven both on the left and the right by competition. You know, they started getting some Newsmax competition, et cetera, which kept pushing the right. The same thing happened on the left, which is CNN, which was probably 20% to the left, started getting pushed by MSNBC. And so you had more and more polarization going on. And I do think the current media marketplace tends to reward polarization because those people are more hardcore fans. Um, but, but you don't gain viewers. You end up with smaller and smaller and smaller audiences the more polarized you get. And I think what you should, in my opinion, you should ignore those fringes and sort of say, I'm gonna get the bulk of right-wing people as opposed to the 
20% most crazy, and the same thing on the left. I want to finish on competition because we've got a great audience question <clears throat> that came about gaming. Netflix has said their biggest competitor, basically, is gaming and why they've analyzed that industry. Is it something you'd look at, look at in any way? Is it something that you think we're sort of move, media content in general has been gamified? Are we moving toward of a gaming landscape? Is it interesting to you? Well, it certainly is interesting to us. You know, we were an investor in a large gaming company, Scopely, which just sold, believe it or not, to Saudi Arabia two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, but we've been an investor in that company for 10 or 11 years. Um, so we certainly believe in gaming and believe in its importance. Um, as for, you know, I think Netflix's comment about gaming was largely about viewership. That, you know, I think Reed spoke mostly about that my competition is people spending hours. My competition is about hours spent much more than it's about money. And, TikTok or and people are spending hours on, on gaming. Um, certainly gaming has influenced content just in terms of speed, in terms of sort of the way shows are laid out. Uh, the Last of Us, which was a big hit on HBO, uh, is derived from a video game. So there, there's certainly- Super Mario, in, no, the latest. Super Mario. I could talk to you for another 15 minutes. Unfortunately, as time tends to disappear so quickly when it comes to content, please do give a large round of applause to the one and only Peter Chen. Thank you very Thank much, you. Pete. <clears throat> Oh.